Joe's the chief market strategy, strategist with the Bank of America in New York. And most importantly, from the point of view of his knowledge of Ireland, he has been the American Chambers, he does the American Chambers annual reports on the Irish US economic relationship, and he's been doing it since 2011. And as we all know, when AmCham speaks, people listen here, so it's a rather important document that attracts considerable attention here when it appears. He's a transatlantic fellow at both the German Marshall Fund of the US in Washington, DC, and at the Center for Transatlantic uh, Relations at the Paul H. Nitzer School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University in Washington. He has a foot, I think, in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Wall Street, and he has a foot in, is it I Street or wherever they, I've forgotten the street, the, the think tanks are on in, in Washington, K Street. Uh, so he lives in Philadelphia, I think, which gets him nicely between the two. Uh, I'd like to welcome him with the name Quinlan, of course, it's obvious he has an Irish-American background and has indeed been named among the top 50 most influential Irish-Americans on Wall Street, no doubt by Niall O'Dowd, but now he gets these things right. And uh, I'd like to welcome you, Joe, and we look forward to hearing from you, you and to asking you some questions. It's fascinating talking about the fact that most of the Eurozone is actually growing faster than the United States. And it's fascinating to just come back from India and see all the good things they're doing with technology. And of course, having spent a lot of time in China, um, I'm very optimistic near term about China. But, you know, I was putting my notes together, and I really, I've been a global economist on Wall Street for quite some time, but it was really 20 years ago next month that kind of struck me and led me down this path <clears throat> towards more transatlantic research. And it was in July 1997 we had the financial crisis in Asia. And everyone, some of you don't remember that, I get that. Um, but nevertheless, prior to that, as a Wall Street economist, you know, before the financial, Asian financial crisis, it was all about the emerging markets, the rise of India and China. And I remember at the time, post the financial crisis in Asia, I wrote a piece and wrote some books and papers and articles and re, kind of redirected the conversation around the transatlantic economy. I had spent, I'd spent plenty of time in Europe uh, before the crisis, I looked a lot of U.S. trade and investment. But when I dug into the numbers in 98, 99 with Dan Hamilton, my great colleague at the Center for Transatlantic Relations uh, in Washington, it was clear that the global economy, despite the NICs, the newly industrialized countries and so forth, that really the shoulders of the global economy still rested on the United States and Europe. And really nothing has changed in the last 20 years. I come out with the transatlantic survey uh, every year we look at the numbers, we look at investment, we look at trade, capital flows, digital flows now more and more. And at the end of the day, it's still, we're kind of the adults, the United States and the European Union. I'm going to use Europe in a broad term, European Union, in terms of what's the driving growth. And if you look at GDP, mergers and acquisition, trade, services, the world is still dependent upon the United States and Europe and the architect we created, right? I mean, there's, in the last 70 years or so, there's been no greater period of prosperity for everyone, rich or poor, urban, rural, whatever, in the, the whole world in the last 70 years. And I kind of remind my clients of that, the ones that are very down, they're not happy, and they think the world's coming to an end. We're living through the greatest period of you know, modern economic prosperity ever in the history of mankind, and it continues. And so if we have the emerging markets you know, coming into play, integrating China, India, Africa, South America, that's a good thing. You know, I, I get it, on a relative basis, the United States and the European Union, of course their share of GDP is going to decline since 1997, and over the last couple of decades. As our share of trade, right, or mergers and acquisition, or capital flows, that's just arithmetically, that's what's gonna happen. You know, we're bigger and others are, well, other countries are growing faster. So to me, it's been a very good backdrop for U.S. corporations in partnering, partnering with the European Union. But what I have seen, particularly in the last, say, five or six years, and I've had long debates with Dan Hamilton, my colleague back in Washington, is that I kind of frame it this way. We seem to be fumbling history, right? We're fumbling history, we being the United States and the European Union, because A, we don't really appreciate the relationship we've created, and we don't understand how deep and how thick it is, right? It's not about trade, it's about foreign direct investment. And that's when I learned that in the Asian financial crisis, because remember, even Bill Clinton, president, said, like, this is a huge calamity, this is a big deal, because Asia's our number one trading partner. That was true then, 
But what the president and his advisors didn't realize, it wasn't about trade, it was more about foreign direct investments, foreign affiliates, foreign affiliate sales, and the growth that comes off that. So at the end of the day, in the media still, there's still not a recognition how great and how deep this relationship is. And more so, and more importantly, B, there's no really appreciation for the jobs that are created, for instance, in Ireland, or how Irish companies are creating jobs in the United States, and how transatlantically, how much commerce is done annually that helps promote growth in North Carolina and or in France or in Germany. So to me, there's a, not a recognition in terms of the great power of this relationship and where we go from here. So, and it, you know, that's, to me, that's kind of where we need to be going and taking the conversation. And I, I kind of like want to make this more interactive, but we're at this cusp of globalization or deglobalization. Does anyone in this room think that deglobalization is possible? Anyone think that is possible? I think it's very possible. Right, okay, one at least, okay, good. Because I think that's a complacency. I asked this question of hedge funds, policymakers, and there's this complacency like, we'll just continue down this path, that we'll have this partnership. And we see it in the markets, we see it in financial flows, I see it when I go to Brussels, that the status quo will somehow be maintained, it'll be, all, it'll be okay in the end. And I'm not so sure, and that's why I got kind of the end of the West question mark, because when I say the end of the West, I'm, I'm really you know, worried about us fumbling history. That the United States, not necessarily turning its back on the rest of the world, but definitely becoming more self-parochial, becoming more isolated, really not looking outward, looking more inward. And I think Europe has been part of that, already down, been down that path. And as I said earlier, we don't understand how deep and how thick this relationship is, and we're doing very poor messaging on the benefits. And then number three, when it relates to this overall backdrop, we're not recognizing <clears throat> that when it comes to the emerging powers, whether it's China in particular, India, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, they're not ready to drive the global economy, right? They're not gonna, I'm not gonna call them free riders, you know? I'm not gonna call them uh, you know, people that kind of just along for the ride, not doing their part, but they're not stakeholders, right? Remember Bob Zellick said this a long time ago about China, like be a stakeholder. Now, China is for China, so to speak, and that makes sense because they've got 1.2 billion people they have to account for, and they still have a lot of income inequality, and they've got a lot of impoverished people still. So the United States and the European Union have done a fabulous job in the last 70 years creating an architect globally that's pulled everyone forward, not just the United States and Europeans, but everyone. And there's really no partnership out there or a single country that can do that. And so that's kind of like the overall arching theme today, the end of the West, is that the West could come to an end in terms of its dominance because its willingness to hand off the baton to players that are not global in mind but more parochial or regional. So I see that as a big issue and not being addressed. That's not really being discussed. That, you know, when it comes to China, sure, they're big, they're large, but they're still not there to carry the day. India, huge, large, but still poor on a per capita basis. Russia clearly more about its own interests than say the global commons. So when you step back, I do think here and now, I'll talk about Washington in a moment where I think we're going, but even in Europe, that really since 2001, 2002, it kind of an indifference, right? I mean, I, I've said this a couple of times, it's kind of like a, it's, it's like a marriage gone bad between the United States and Europe. And they're still married, there's no divorce company. But we just take each other for granted that we're gonna wake up every day and be there. And maybe someday that's gonna change. And we saw that clearly last year with Brexit, right? We, we kind of hear again that complacency, the status quo, we'll, we'll work it through. And that was kind of a jarring shock to the system that yes, the status quo can be taken out from underneath us and you've got a different playing field. So in Washington here now, I've just kind of my messaging for you today, you know, we have an administration, uh, to put it mildly, that's different, right? Sees the world differently. America first, that doesn't mean the end of globalization. That doesn't mean we're gonna turn inward, but there's clearly an emphasis that's coming from the general public, by the way, not just this Trump administration, about looking out for the U.S. interests first and the world second. And that's a different tone. And really against that, leaning against that, are U.S. companies, right? The administration may be talking about doing it alone, America first, bringing the jobs home, walking away from the Paris Accord Agreement and so forth, but U.S. companies are still very much multinational, still very much globalized, even states. 
And a good example, I think, of where we are is post the Paris Climate Accord agreement that we, the United States walked away from. It's very telling that a lot of U.S. companies stepped up and said, hey, we're still in favor of this agreement, and we're going to work together with the rest of the world to make it happen. And then you had go governors like Jerry Brown of California step up, New York State. So I, I bring that message to you in the sense that maybe the U.S. from a Washington perspective sees the world differently, is going to tread some different water here. But the main players, the multinationals, the states that matter, where a lot of you know, Irish companies are invested in and vice versa, that's going to continue. So I don't see the end of globalization, but there's a testing time period here. And I do think when it comes to the post-crisis recovery here in the United States, we're well on our way to one of the longest economic expansions in U.S. history. That we still have a lot of people to take care of, that don't feel that they're getting their fair share. We have a lot of women not participating, or males in, in the prime labor ages not participating as well. So there's a lot of work to be done. But nevertheless, when you kind of step back, I'm not giving up on the transatlantic economy. It's still the broadest shoulders the world rests upon. But there is an indifference right now that has to be managed very carefully. And the good news is, when you really look at the kind of the economic cycle, the U.S. is expanding by 2 2.5% this year, and you're now seeing the Eurozone in a cyclical recovery as well. Maybe you've got a German-French alliance being built, formed, that's going to help drive more structural change in Europe that surprises us in terms on the upside, you know, more employment growth, more innovation more growth that helps drive more trade investment, M&A, and so forth between the United States and Europe. It would be, I have to say from a U.S. perspective, it would be nice once in a while if the European Union drove the train instead of being in the back of the train, right? And it is be clearly driving growth. So anytime there's a backdrop by which the pie is expanding on both sides of the pond, that's a favorable backdrop for policymakers to come together. I'm not giving up on that. I mean, TTIP, I never believed in TTIP. If anyone did, raise your hand and we can talk afterwards because I think it was just too ambitious, too aggressive. But there's parts of it we could build on and off that I think we will as we go deeper into the next couple of years, particularly in data. You know, the digital global economy, right? That's very much at play, very much in the halfway of the development status. So a single digital market transatlantically could be a huge boost, huge boost for both parties and the global economy when it comes to setting the standards. So I'm going to just kind of finish. I'm going to give you back some time so we can have a conversation. But do I believe at the end of the West, it depends on what day and what time I get up, so to speak, or where I get up. But I do fairly clearly feel that if we're fast forward 100 years from now, historians will be writing about, I hope not, but they could be writing about how the United States and Europe, the wealthy, powerful, brand, core companies, great companies, how they kind of fumbled the future by A, not recognizing what they have, what they've created, how much beneficial it is, how it's driving growth, an unwillingness to work together during difficult times, and not realizing that the rest of the world is still very much dependent upon them, that China and Russia, they're not ready to carry the global baton to drive growth. They're not about the global commons. They're more about regionalism and their own self-interest. So are we in a world of chaos? Some people say disarray or chaos. I don't think so. No, I mean, there's still, still rules, regulations. Corporations are still doing what they do. They get up every morning. They produce goods and services. You've got a great economy like Ireland still churning out growth, creating human capital, building the global bonds to bring us together. I don't think that's changing anytime soon. Brexit is a separate issue. I think that's a big issue for the UK, but not for the global economy, to be honest with you. I mean, Ireland, of course, is important what happens. But for the global economy, this will pass, so to speak, without much disruption. The biggest challenge going forward, particularly for the Trump administration, Brussels, Germany, France, Ireland, UK, is to recognize that we're a very small percentage of the world, right? But the rest of the world is still dependent upon us. They still look upon our brand, our policy making, our multilateral institutions to drive growth. It's, it's still ours for the taking, right? I mean, I hate losing, but if I lose, it's not because I fumble the ball, it's because I want the competition to be better, right? Well, the competition isn't better just now between the United States and Europe versus the rest of the world. So that's kind of where we're at. When it comes to the US, as I said, cyclical rebound, Trump, President Trump, different 
politician, a politician in quotes to be used because he doesn't like to be called a politician, but you're seeing clearly, clearly, that there's checks and balances in Washington, in the state houses, state attorney generals, and so forth, that will keep the U.S., I think, more into the center than po most people realize. To me, I'm not worried about the Trump administration. It's just it's the indifference, the complacency that's kind of enveloped the transatlantic relationship over the last two or three, four, five years. That indifference is a, creates erosion in trust and confidence, and I, at some point, Further down the road, we will realize this great thing we have fumbled called the Transatlantic Alliance.